and here's the single neuromuscular junction. Again, your sartorius muscle could be a foot, two feet long, depending on how tall you are. That single muscle fiber has a single motor end plate. So when this motor neuron tells that one to contract, that's the only motor neuron that's talking to this, right? It doesn't get mixed signals from two different motor neurons. Only one motor neuron is controlling this muscle fiber. Each muscle cell only has one single motor neuron. For all this, right, here's your muscles down here. Here are the nerves coming down. They're branching off. They're going into those different levels of organization to innervate those single muscle fibers, right? They're branching off in multiple ways, but they're going to innervate muscle fibers within there, right? And so here is the, again, each one of these individual muscle cells, right? There's a single motor neuron. It branches off into these little things called telodendria. That's the branches. But you'll notice one motor neuron. Here's this cell here. It's got one motor neuron. Here's another neuromuscular junction. Here's another one. Here's another one, right? So this motor, each cell has one neuromuscular junction, but you'll notice this motor neuron is innervating at least in this picture, one, two, three, four, five muscle fibers. So a motor neuron can innervate a bunch of fibers, but each of these motor neurons are innervated by that single one. There's no other motor neuron, no other neuromuscular, neuromuscular junction we could see. So here's the cartoon version of it. You got the axon coming down, it branches off. And in this case, it's innervating four individual muscle fibers. And this muscle fiber will not have any more neuromuscular junctions, right? So a single motor neuron can inter innervate any number of myofibers within a fascicle. So it's gonna branch off, and in this case it's doing four, but it could be 10, could be 100, it could be 1,000 muscle fibers that it's innervating. So this is what, when we're talking about a motor unit, that's the definition a single motor neuron and all the myofibers it controls. So in this case, this red motor neuron that's in the spinal cord sends its axon out through the spinal nerve. And then in this case, it's showing that it's innervating these three individual muscle fibers. Here's another motor neuron, this purple one coming out and innervating these two muscle, muscle fibers. And so motor unit, this is the definition of a motor unit single motor neuron and all the myofibers it control. So we have a red motor neuron and a purple motor unit right here. Right here, we're looking at a picture. We have a green and a yellow one, right? How many, if I asked you this on a question right here, what's the size of the green motor unit? All you got to do is count all the green muscle fibers right here and tell me it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, or whatever, however, 11, a motor unit is one motor neuron per 11 fibers. And then you'd count the yellow ones, right? That's, that's how you would determine. So if I gave you a number, it's always one motor neuron. And if I just give you the muscle fiber number, you can determine that. So about those motor units, there's different sizes. As I said, some motor units, some single motor neurons control 10 fibers, some control 100, some control 1,000, some control 2,000. This all depends on how much control you need of that particular muscle. So your little eye muscles right over here need a lot of fine control. So a motor neuron there is gonna be like maybe less than 10 individual muscle fibers and it's gonna give a lot of precise control. You don't need that kind of control for your leg muscles. So a single motor neuron can control 1,000, 2,000 muscle fibers. So a single motor neuron will send out a command It'll branch off once it gets into that fascicle, branch off a thousand, two thousand times and innervate a thousand muscle fibers. If your one of these eye muscles right here had a hundred muscle fibers, you'd have 10 motor neurons controlling that, right? If this muscle right here, so let's just say a thousand, it's controlling a thousand muscle fibers. If there's 10,000 fibers in it, then there's 10 motor neurons controlling that, right? So that's, that's the idea behind the motor unit. And the significance is twofold, but this is one of it, right? It's gonna 
it's going to allow for a lot of fine control for the less fibers that you're controlling. So single motor neuron, all the muscle fibers are controlled. And so you have right here, you have three different motor neurons, a purple one, a blue one, and a red one. Purple one right here, motor neuron, or whatever the numbers are, right? They're controlling, and then the, the fibers that it controls are color-coded too, just for convenience, right? So at any given point, right, these, let's just say these are the total. Let's just say this is the entire muscle right here for fun, right? It's probably more like a fascicle, but let's just say it's the entire muscle. At any given point, just for normal postural contraction, like a muscle tone, right? your purple one is gonna go down and cause these purple ones to contract and then stop. And then the blue one's gonna go down right after it in sequent and cause those muscle fibers to contract, then stop. And then the red ones are gonna go down and cause those to contract. So they're gonna revolve in normal tension if creating any tension against it, then this, they're gonna go by on a rotating basis right here to give you muscle tone. This is how muscle tone is created. Right? When you're just doing not much, your muscles are kind of relaxed, they're not completely flaccid. Right? You do have some muscle activation, you do have contraction, but it's mild, right? And by doing this rotating basis right here, you can not tire out all the orange ones, right? You could do this the same way by only contracting the orange ones, but they get tired. So you want to do it on a rotating basis. The total force that's exerted by the muscle depends on the number of activated motor units. If you're normal, if you just have muscle tone, right, then maybe only one at a time is going to be activated. So right now I have a desk under me. If I want to kind of put a little tension under my, to try to lift it up a little bit, right, maybe only one of these is going to be activated. But if I put a little more pressure on it, right? You have the red one activated, then maybe the blue one kicks in and both of them are activated at once. And then I put a lot of pressure on it, then the purple one kicks in and all three of them are going at once. This is how you generate force by increasing the number of activated motor units, right? So more, more contraction, more force is generated. This muscle tone just on a rotating basis, activating all the individual motor neurons in here, right? so that only a couple of them uh, are contracting at once. And so muscle tone, how it's maintained. And then the second question in your learning objectives here are about the receptors involved, right? And what function does muscle tone serve the body? The function that it serves is your normal postural muscles. Right now you're standing or you're sitting, you're not flopping over, you're not completely flaccid, right? You need a general muscle tone to, number one, keep you upright, and to keep your normal sort of body tension. And it also, like your rotator cuff muscles and your knee around your muscles around your knee are also securing your joints in, right? They're also kind of keeping those sort of mobile joints uh, secure, right? So muscle tone is important inside of the stability of joints as well. So those are the two functions. So the second question is what receptors are involved? Oh, this is what I just mentioned. The resting tension, muscle tone, by only some of the motor units and enough tension is created to create tense muscle without affecting movement. All right, so the receptor thing. Here's the last bit about this. The muscle tone that you get is not, you're not doing that voluntary, right? When you're standing upright, you don't have to sit there and tell your you know, your leg muscles and your back muscles and your ab muscles to kind of hold yourself upright, right? That's all automatic. That's all subconscious or unconscious behavior that's going on there. And so to do that, you have all these reflexive systems that are managing your normal postural tone. So these are two of the receptors that I'm going to talk about here that manage that whole muscle tone and as well as sort of control of muscle contraction. Right? So these are proprioceptors. And this will come up. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you about this for this one. I will maybe for the next unit for nervous system. But these are receptors embedded either within your muscle tissue or in the tendons that tell your body, your automatic systems, whether your muscle is being stretched or whether it's being contracted and then to do something about it. So these are the Golgi tendon organs, which are 
it's in your tendons, Golgi tendon organ, or muscle spindles, which are embedded within your muscle tissue itself. So for both of these, right, you have these muscle spindles. These are the receptors. It's hooked up to a sensory neuron, the ones that's going to detect what's going on here, and bring that information into this central nervous system to tell your body what to do. In this case, it's a very simple reflex that goes in there, talks to a motor neuron. And so we'll get into exactly what it does, but it, it's going to respond to this sensory input. Same thing over here. Right? You have a sensory neuron and a motor neuron. Your neuromuscular spindle fibers are going to monitor the length of the muscle. Right? So when you're stretching it, it's going to cause a signal. And that sensory neuron is going to be activated and provide that input into the nervous system. Right? So when it's stretching, these spindle fibers are stretched out. And when they, your muscle is relaxed or contracted, right, there's no signal coming in. So when these muscles is stretched, your overall response is to tell this motor neuron to send a signal in to contract. And that's just a normal sort of balance, reflexive balancing or reflexive thing to keep muscle tone and to keep your muscle from being overstretched and so on, right? So the second one, the second receptor is embedded within your tendons over here in the dense regular connective tissue. And what this does is to detect the amount of tension placed on the tendon, right? So that means your muscle is contracting, you're pulling hard on this bone and your response right here is to, when this response comes in, is to go back and stop that motor neuron from making these muscles contract. Basically, it's stopping the signal right here. It's really, there's a inhibitory input. Don't worry about it, but your end result is it's relaxing it. So if this is contracting too much, for whatever reason, this Golgi tendon reflex arc is going to tell it to stop. What you want to know for all that is when I talked about those nensering, these, these kind of facts right here. Muscle spindle fibers react to stretching, and the response is to contract. Golgi tendon organs monitor amount of tension and their response is to relax the muscle. So the concept of the motor unit gives you an idea of the control over any particular muscle. And although we can consciously control muscle contraction, there are also those unconscious systems that maintain normal resting muscle tone and muscle tension involved in things like postural control that rely on input from those types of receptors. So the last thing I want to mention here relating to the next topic is that each individual motor unit is composed of a specific type of muscle fibers. So next section, we'll talk about those types of fibers. See you next time.